you've got your slide up. That's good. Um, yeah. And uh, so uh, I want to welcome you to this uh, evening. Well, for some people, evening, carry down in uh, New Zealand, it's not, but for the rest of us. Um, session. This is uh, Major Tom Mussman at the U.S. Military Academy at West Point, New York. And he's going to be talking about exactly what his title says, helping new modelers model with a clearly defined process. So uh, take it away, Tom. All right. Thank you so much. Uh, so first off, yeah, thank you for to you and uh, your team for putting this together and inviting me to share some of, some of my ideas here. Uh, as uh, Brian said, today we'll discuss kind of this making or helping students uh, understand new models. So just uh, some background for what I do at West Point. So we teach a first year, not only first year, but first semester uh, modeling and ODE course. So it's actually a little unique because we don't require linear algebra or uh, multivariate calculus before you start. It's like straight out of uh, single variable calculus. Um, the other thing that uh, kind of is unique to us is uh, we don't we require everyone to take it. So if you had calculus in high school, um, you don't get to validate your math credits. Uh, you have to take a differential equation modeling course, even if you happen to be, I think uh, one of our SCUDEM participants was a international relations and Mandarin Chinese major and you know taking differential equations. So certainly all walks of life. Um, and then there's certainly, you know, if you've had calculus in high school, they're mathematically inclined, but they've got inconsistent experience with modeling. Some people have done it before, others not. Uh, so what I'm going to start talking through is I'll talk through this uh, MAA definition of strong modeling and then talk about helping students getting there uh, with a process and then we'll transition into how do I take this modeling process and put it into a course. Uh, and then I'll end with some uh, concluding thoughts. So I'll spend uh, a few minutes or give you guys 30 seconds to read this wall of text that I happen to have put on my slide. Um, so one of the interesting things I had to do getting ready for teaching a course, our uh, department head makes us do a literature review of kind of the literature of what do modeling courses and what do um, ODE courses cover. And one of the quotes I came across in my journey was to this this quote from the MAA in their modeling class summary. And they talk about kind of breaking modeling into the strong and the weak variety, right? Strongs are open-ended, um, lots of possible options. Uh, the scutum prompts kind of are where I go to when I think about a strong modeling question, whereas a, weak, a weaker modeling pro problem might be kind of some standard uh, heat transfer spring mass where it's pretty obvious where you're going from the start of the problem. So just as thoughts on on my observations, trying to get strong modelers to be strong, right? So specifically, especially in our experience, modeling is not intuitive to many students. They kind of live in this math class. They're used to the teacher tells me a formula and I do it. Uh, and they're really not comfortable with his guessing, at least at the start. Um, <clears throat> a few times I've even commented to my students, hey, you're really good at guessing. You should like major in math or something. They're like, what do you mean guessing in math, right? Uh, they don't get that idea very well. Um, and very often, kind of when, when a new student gets a stronger or harder problem, they they struggle, right? They open their textbook, they look and see, aha, is it a spring mass? No. Is it a mixing tank? No. Is it a, um, you know, temperature or, you know, Newton's law of cooling? And then they're like, well, it's not something I've seen before. What am I supposed to do? How do I, how do I start this process? And so the idea of the process <clears throat> is to give the students a method to, you know, one step at a time, eat the elephant that is making a huge model. So I'm gonna start off kind of going through uh, three or four textbooks and kind of what I have learned or done a brief lit review on what is a modeling process. So we use uh, Dennis Zill's uh, textbook as our textbook at West Point. Um, my apologies to uh, Kurt Ryan, but um, so this is his his process, right? You start off kind of making some assumptions about the world. You make turn those into DEs. They become math. You solve the DEs. They're still math, and then you kind of use a graph or some kind of uh, 
yeah, some kind of graph or something to to transition back into the real world or the real world, and then make some different assumptions as necessary. Uh, the thing I there's a couple complaints I have with it. Probably the first complaint is when one makes a flow chart, what you do should be where you are should be in the boxes, and what you do should be around the arrows. Um, so some of the he's a little inconsistent in the way he draws it. And the thing is, it doesn't necessarily tell students exactly what to do when they show up, right? Like the square is nice, but like I'm supposed to make assumptions, but please tell me more, right? A, a student, students just don't make assumptions easily. So then we'll talk about Boyce de Prima. So Boyce de Prima and uh, um, kind of focuses on this unit type, um, type of figuring out what the differential equation is. So we uh, identify independent and dependent variables, right? And then we kind of find the law of nature that's, you know, Hooke's law or some kind of chemical reaction, something that, that underlies it. And then we um, make this into an ODE. And so, he, he, and this kind of dimensional analysis seems to be another common way to help students open this can of worms that is modeling and start trying to make models on their own. And then for note for the sixth point, right? We'll note that sometimes models can become more complex and turn into a system, which is true. Uh, but we'll kind of save that note and talk about it later. So this was a model I came across in grad school. So this is a very data sciencey way to to think about it, right? So again, we're not quite in the ODE world, but we start with a real world problem and my teacher was a little more of a pure math kind of guy and he saw data science as just a big linear algebra problem. Um, and so he saw it as a projection, right? In the sense of linear algebra that you take this real world and turn it into a math problem through some sort of projection. And the funny thing is we actually even do this in like ODEs, right? Cause when you're like, well, I've got a baseball dropping through the air, let's talk about drag. Well. You know, we pretend the whole baseball acts at its point mass, right, or its center of mass, but which is true, uh, but that's a significant projection from thinking about atoms and things like that. But either way, once we have our math problem, we code, find a solution, do an inverse projection, um, and then that gives us our real world solution where hopefully we can kind of get some idea of where to go next uh, with our with our model. Uh, the one we use is a modeling process that kind of maybe synthesizes many of these ideas, right? So certainly, uh, obviously, we turned from a square into a triangle because we decided the real world was one point instead of two, but that's not significant. Um, perhaps there's some help in that we kind of tell students what to do to take a problem out of the real world and move it into a mathematical model. Um, you know, a lot of times it's laws of physics and things like that, that, that are going to be at play in this, in this transform idea. Uh, we make a model and kind of do the same thing as we've been discussing before, where we solve it and then go back to the real world. And then again, we kind of come back to this iterative process idea where you come back, it probably wasn't good enough, or, you know, you would have liked it to model just a little bit better. So we would say we would refine our assumptions and, you know, make a make a new model often when i teach it it's almost like a you should be thinking about deleting or getting rid of your one of your assumptions like your modification to the model should be helping you like not have to worry about an assumption or or get rid of one of the assumptions you made right and like outside temperature is constant it's a bad assumption when you're doing cooling so let's talk about how do we make the ambient temperature a function of time or weather or something like that so we actually break it down even further uh, so we kind of give this as a, this is a mixing tank. I think it's a word problem written about, um, you know, you're trying to pure or clean a water tank. So the army likes to bring water tanks around. So there's an army application to using chlorine to clean your, uh, your water, your water tank. Um, and we use it as a, as a mixing problem, right? So it kind of really walks students through, like, here's the things you're supposed to do to transform the problem into a real world or into your math world. Um, you know, we're here we are defining our variables, making assumptions about evenly mixed and, you know, input chlorine concentration. And then at the end, the key is, right, we're trying to make this uh, differential equation or initial value problem, really, because we need an initial condition to solve. Uh, and then we move through, right, this is the solve, which I will not worry about because we are all differential experts. Um, 
And then we, we, we launch into what does this mean in the real world, right? And we have the summary of, well, eventually it's going to be clean in the long term, right? Long term behavior. And after about three hours, you can drink the water because it's safe. Um, so we, we, we find this generally helpful in kind of helping students to open the can of worms that is modeling and start the kind of walking around the triangle or iterating. Um, the other thing I, I thought about as we were working through this was, does the application matter? So for instance, uh, we look at the Boister Prima and I know, uh, you know, Kurt Bryan has a, a similar kind of unit analysis chapter as well. And in the physics and chemistry models, those are particularly helpful, right? PV equals NRT all has units on it. Um, chemical reactions, you know, you've got concentrations and rates of reaction, Hooke's law, you know, all these kind of things that have predefined units and really help you work through the differential equation. Uh, but very often kind of on the other side, when you start talking, you know, punishing infants, for instance, um, your units technique is not necessarily going to help you. You know, nobody's established a constant of anything with respect to punishing infants. You kind of are almost wading into the world of the unknown a lot more aggressively. But honestly, you could spend a long time talking about this, this question about like, well, should we change how we teach students to model depending on what they're trying to model and the discipline that they land in? Um, but I guess I'm going to kind of leave that, that tangent there and kind of switch courses in a different way. So kind of the next thing we're going to talk about is, so suppose you had a modeling process, right? So you have a modeling process that you want to teach your cadets, which we do. Uh, the modeling process is kind of outlined in green here. Uh, the next four slides, I'm going to kind of highlight these four different ways of how do you integrate this process into a course, right? So kind of here in the first order system, we're teaching modeling sometime during first order, you know, maybe at the start, maybe at the end, something to that extent. Uh, sometimes we can teach the process or think about the process even before we start ODEs. Uh, we'll talk more in depth about systems and why one would teach a process down here. Uh, at the end of your your ODE class, and then uh, kind of my last my last proposal of where do we put systems into a differential equation is kind of a hybrid thing that um, we ended up doing for one semester, and I think we'll continue doing, um, but we'll we'll discuss that more later. So kind of delving into the first order process uh, or teaching in the first order. Um, this is something that I did for at least two years of teaching here at West Point. So generally what the way this works is you kind of hand students a collection of traditional models, you know, mixing tank, heat transfer, disease, all those kind of things. And then the iteration that you're trying to teach the students or the kind of make assumptions, fix assumptions is done by adding, adding certain terms. So I'm actually rather proud of myself because evaporation applies to mixing tank heat transfer and draining tank, right? As a concern, you might want to uh, implement into your um, equation. And temperature kind of matters with drag population and disease, although I think time of year is probably a uh, for population and disease, right? And teaching students how do you take these, these new variables or unknowns or things that you assumed and turn them into an equation. Perhaps the other question would be, okay, let's uh, let's realize that we actually don't need to be thinking about differential equations to talk about defining variables, making assumptions, thinking about error, removing error, right? For instance, if I, you know, we live on the Hudson, right? How much water is in the Hudson River is a, a great question, right? Students have to start thinking about is the Hudson River a triangle or a prism or a square, right? And kind of wrestling with these, I'm approximating the real world kind of questions and how do I articulate the error or kind of the assumption I made and turn it into some kind of limitation in my model. Um, or you can go into the, the start of the differential equation world and, you know, there people have been modeling population growth, most notably Fibonacci. And apparently even before Fibonacci, they were kind of doing the Fibonacci sequence, describing the growth of rabbits, you know, hundreds of years before calculus was a thing, um, let alone differential equations, right? So perhaps there's this, this way to help students kind of understand the intuition they already have about projecting math into the world or projecting the real world into math. 
Uh, the other way, I haven't actually done this one, but I think it's an interesting concept. Um, the idea would be we start modeling with first order and, and higher order and do weak examples, right? So we're like, well, here's a mixing tank. Here's kind of, you know, concentration in, low rate, things like that. Um, you know, heat transfer, draining tank, right? Kind of these learn the parameters and put them into the model. Um, and that's particularly true as well in higher order, which tends to deal mostly with spring masses. Um, and then as we delve into higher order systems and we start thinking about like, what's a harder question we should be asking? Like, how do we, you know, build these predator preys and then modify the predator prey and build on these models? And at that point, maybe you start saying, okay, I'm going to start giving you a process because the modeling's starting to get hard. Uh, and so kind of taking this process to help the students model uh, later. The next one we'll talk about is the hybrid system that we are, that uh, I just did last year. So kind of my observation was, well, let's start with this coffee cup, right? It's a classic cooling problem. Um, <clears throat> we've all kind of done the set coffee cup out in room temperature or on cold day, how long till it's whatever, right? But then what we can do is we can kind of think about, well, let's try to improve our model, right? So the first time we go around the circle, we kind of make a standard heat transfer model, right? We solve our heat standard heat transfer and we interpret, but then we realize, you know, well, the heat's going to flow through the mug differently than how it's going to flow through the air, which kind of feeds us directly into systems, right? So kind of built, you can change your heat transfer or in general, anything that's kind of modeled in this way, um, you know, you can change your heat transfer problem into a system of heat transfer problems, which obviously eventually you could cut this into lots of pieces and make a PDE, but we won't quite get there. Uh, and so it kind of leads to this natural transition where you start teaching modeling in first order, but then you kind of reverse the course order and you bring your systems uh, immediately after first order so that you have an opportunity to um, an opportunity to kind of use the modeling process and kind of show students systems as a tool to kind of add refinement uh, to their to their process. Um, right, so that kind of concludes the where can you where can you teach it or where on the course you could kind of think it think of it right first order before first order systems and then kind of this hybrid idea. And the next slide is actually my favorite game. That's where I put three random quotes on the board. And then I try to connect them to my talk and I try to connect them to each other. So <clears throat> I'm teaching a lot of first year students. So I could ask questions like, you know, why should I major in mathematics? Good question. I think you should. Um, but a lot of people are going to major in STEM or other things. And so I kind of like to think about it as, or I explain it to them this way that kind of, Math sits in the middle of a lot of disciplines, right? Computer scientists care about algorithms, which is really kind of a math subject. Um, mechanical engineers, physicists, chemists all care about ODEs. So maybe I should put them all next to each other, right? But there's kind of this unifying thread of being a mathematician, of being able to kind of interact with uh, multiple disciplines and kind of take some very similar process, right? So actually a lot of the decision questions that come out of OR can be rephrased in a mechanical engineering construct of um, of controls. And so, you know, if the point of the math is to be able to help people solve problems, right, you need to be good at understanding how those people are kind of transforming their real world problem into a, their real world problem kind of into a math problem. And right? so kind of that process is helpful in being a math major because you understand uh, what people are trying to do with the math you want. Uh, the next quote is uh, from some colleagues of mine who are less fond of the modeling world or kind of the teach modeling first or modeling heavily ODEs. And kind of the quote is that what are modelers but bad physicists, right? We brought up this coffee cup as an example, right? How do we actually solve it? Well, we actually solve it using a PDE and we've known that forever or for a long time, right? So why are we going to waste our students per se, uh, waste our students time trying to slowly figure out how to do this coffee cup correctly when all they're going to do is wrong because they haven't learned enough math to do it right. 
right? And, and I'd, I'd argue that's actually what we're trying to do, right? We're trying to get them to be bad physicists because we're trying to teach them to like play with the world and explore the world. Just like when we teach calculus with limits, yes, it's not precise. It's not gonna be precise until you take real analysis, but I want to teach you the math and I want you to think mathematically and understand mathematically, just as I want you to try to think about how do, um, how to be a bad physicist so that perhaps you can learn how to be a physicist. So the other one is I was doing some reading on literature or some learn, reading about education. And I came across this quote, right? Kind of the two fields that never should have been separated in the first place, literature and history. And the book goes on kind of to describe, well, you should always study literature at history for literature is what people are thinking and history is what they're doing. Right. So to kind of separate the, uh, you know, Uncle Tom's cabin from the history of the Civil War is to kind of separate the thought from the action. And basically, if you want to get a good education, you should try to do those together as best you can. And I think the same thing is true with science and math. Right. That the science and the, you know, the physics, you know, Newton is discovering calculus as he's trying to do physics and explain physics processes. So. In the ideal world, you know, if it weren't for the um, kind of the silos of departments that have made we have made, uh, there would be some, I think, some very good modeling to be had as you connect a science class uh, to a math class and kind of bounce back and forth and think about these models and these base laws. And then I started thinking and I realized when we talk about this modeling process, we're not talking about anything, you know, modeling process of how do I model? Well, all I'm really doing is the scientific method, right? The scientific method is I take a real world observation, I make some hypothesis, usually phrased in some sort of math construct, you know, and then predict things and try to predict the world around me with a scientific method. Um, and so if and, and I, I think perhaps what we're really doing when we talk about modeling in this process of modeling is we're, we're kind of refusing the subjects of math and science back together with, uh, with modeling. And, you know, in my opinion, they never should have been separated uh, into two separate castles, especially, especially kind of at the, at the lower levels. So kind of in conclusion, right, we're talking about... Um, do we want to use a process? I started off kind of exploring these are what processes are and kind of how they might help a student, especially one of my students who's a first semester freshman for starting modeling. Uh, there's a lot of different ways you might try to integrate it. I gave you five options and I'm sure you guys are good enough to think of more. Um, I think this process will make them better integrated, whether they're a scientist, engineer, mathematician, or international relations student. Um, this process of understanding the world around you uh, is good and helpful to them as people. Um, not to brag, but our process helped USMA uh, kind of in this first semester differential equation course. We got five out of 17 of our teams were able to get outstandings, which in the past, actually, we haven't quite met those numbers. So um, rather exciting for us. Um, and last of all, uh, out of my conclusion, I'm I like to be very abstract. I don't like to kind of, I haven't given a talk yet that kind of delves into the details of what should a differential equation teach course teach. If you want to learn about kind of what we did or what we do uh, over at West Point, uh, in the next half hour, Brittany Oletti will go through all the, the nitty gritty or all the pieces of how uh, we put our differential equations course together over there. With that, I'd like to thank uh, all my fellow teachers that have, you know, listened to me talk and expound about math modeling, uh, and of course, Dr. Winkle for starting me down the process. And again, thanks to Simio Expo and all those people. So, with that, I'd like to uh, turn it over for questions. Well, thank you, thank you very much, Tom. Oh, everybody's happy, including Jeremy's dog. Okay, that's good. It's good. Um, uh, are there any questions or uh, comments or contributions? Um, I, I'd, I'd love to start. Jeremy, go ahead. 
Thanks. So that, that was a really, really cool talk. Okay. I actually have a lot of questions, but I'll, I'll eat the elephant one bite at a time. So, <laughs> um, you presented a lot of good models. Okay. Uh, how many models will you show your student? Will you show one of them? Will you show 10 of them? Will you revisit different models and compare and contrast? So I've actually played back and forth with this. So we kind of, my first year teaching, we, I did the, you know, here's 10 models, kind of let's talk through them. And then based on classroom constraints later, I started trimming down to like, let's live in one model and explore the one model. And you guys will figure out the other ones later. Um, so kind of last year I gave a talk called modeling in depth, which kind of addresses that exact question. And I kind of, I reached the conclusion that you should teach fewer, fewer, more in depth. Um, particularly with our class, we get a chance for them to do self-driven projects at the end. So as they go around and see other self-driven projects, they can become better or, or kind of understand the breadth of what a differential equation can do. Thank you. Yeah, Kerry. Yeah, um, great talk, um, Tom. Thank you. Um, I was just wondering, and I know it's difficult with first year students, but do you get a chance to address the question of model testing? And, and if so, what approaches you use for, for that? Yeah, so that's uh, that's been uh, kind of the data literacy side of uh, the course where we we certainly, towards the end, we start dealing with uh, parameter estimation type questions that fit go towards fitting data. At the start, it's usually kind of, you get as many points as you have unknown values or unknown parameters and you know solve for the parameters from however many data points we gave you. Uh, and then, right, as I said, towards the end, we start more aggressively parameter fitting, but we never quite go into gradient descent because they haven't even done gradient yet because it's, you know, they haven't done multivariate calculus. Very good, thank you. Um, one of the things is that people are concerned about the transferability of the differential equations into another course. And as Tom was thinking, I'm thinking, that's begging the question because I, like him, thought science and math, uh, you know, are artificially broken apart. I realize these are giant enterprises and perhaps deserve their own attention, but we we constantly worry about, are we able to transfer the math over to the discipline? And in effect, by teaching the math in the context of a discipline, we're trying to make that transferability or that gap um, easier. And I admire what you're trying to do there. Um, and uh, I guess I have another question is, how do you engage new faculty who are just coming to West Point to be on the faculty to sort of embrace this? How does the leadership work there to get everybody on the same page? Yeah, so kind of first comment to you about kind of the integrating, you sparked a thought when you said integrating the sciences. Um, it, there, there is a challenge in the differential equation world of some people have had physics and some people have not. Some people have, you know, grabbed, you know, they took two semesters of chemistry and are very familiar with kind of these constants and things that are, I think are, you know, I also have. So it's it's very obvious. But if you if you've never read about drag or thought about gravity within a physics construct, some of these differential equations like aren't intuitive to you because you haven't dealt with them. Um, and then kind of integrating new faculty. Uh, so West Point has like a summer program in which they bring uh, people in to work through teaching. And actually everyone teaches, every new faculty member teaches the same uh, math modeling course. It's actually a math modeling without calculus course. So we at West Point focus very heavily on the modeling, uh, kind of seeing it as this whole person development of the math side of things. Excuse me, I have to leave because I'm moderating another section, but you mentioned Brittany's talk and, you know, we have three really good talks following this, so you have to pick, but they will be uh, videos online, um, maybe later this evening and certainly tomorrow, as well as Tom's if you wanted to get notes. Um, so, uh, again, I want to thank Tom from me personally, but I have to leave to go to another room and uh, we will see you around the quad, as they say. So, take yeah, care. I'm happy to stick around and continue to take yes, questions after Brian. You can do well. that. Yeah. This room will be open. Okay.
Uh, sorry, Kerry. Oh, just really quickly, what was the name of the course, the first year course of the modeling? Was it modeling, math modeling without equations or? Uh, the one that everyone else teaches with, uh, it's yes. MA 103, what do they call it? Uh, I think it's just called mathematical modeling. I don't know. I've never taught it. I, I was one of the lucky few that uh, went straight to modeling with differential equations as a teacher. But it, the okay. course title is MA 103. MA 103. No, no, that's great. Thank you. I'll have a little follow up with that. Thank, thank you for a good talk as well. I oh, enjoyed it. Thank you. I'm going to have to quiet. Yeah. And I'm going to quietly go to my next talk. So okay. Thank you for... Enjoy. Thank you. <laughs> you.